Hey, this is Mr. Sato. Let's learn about figurative language. Figurative language is just saying one thing and meaning something different from what you appear to be saying on the surface. They're figures of speech. When you say it cost me an arm and a leg, you're using figurative language. I would hope. You should know how to recognize it when you're reading and how to use it when you're writing. Actually, you probably already use figurative language, but just might not be up on the terminology. So we're going to look at these eight kinds of figurative language. Also, there's a short quiz at the end if you want to test your knowledge. First, metaphor. This is when you say one thing is another thing. Like if I talk about my elderly dog being an inert lump of coal, this is what he looks like. As you can see, he isn't actually a combustible black rock of carbonized plant matter. I'm just saying he hardly ever moves and sleeps like 23 hours a day. That's a metaphor in the form of a noun. My dog equals a lump of coal. This noun is that noun. That's a metaphor. But a lot of the time, metaphors take the form of verbs, like I was eclipsed by my brother's popularity, or the book sailed across the room, or my mother erupted when she saw my report card. Those statements aren't meant literally because moons and planets eclipse, boats sail, and only volcanoes erupt, literally. Hidden in this sentence about tennis star Rafael Nadal, the adjective is a metaphor. Nadal's most characteristic stroke is his searing, spinning, miserable-to-return forehand drive. Spot the metaphor? Searing isn't something a tennis ball can be, not literally. It is something a red-hot skillet does to a steak. But I guess those forehand drives are powerful and intimidating, painful to handle just like a red-hot skillet. The feelings and associations that come with the red-hot skillet rub off on our image of Nadal's tennis playing. It isn't just fun to listen to, it adds a shade of meaning. That's what figurative language does. Similes are my favorite kind of figurative language, and they're really easy to explain. This is when you say one thing is like another, as opposed to saying it is something, as you would do with a metaphor. Now, a simile can't actually be literally like that thing. Walt Frazier stood as tall as a library bookcase isn't actually a simile because it could literally be true. A simile is a figure of speech, so it must imaginatively compare two things that aren't actually literally the same. A simile would be Walt Frazier stood as tall as the skyscrapers silhouetting the New York horizon. Not literally true, but figuratively true. A simile uses like or as. If you said, they were as quiet as a quartet waiting for the downbeat. That's a simile, and a good one. Scott Russell Sanders wrote that guilt burns like acid in my veins. I love that phrase. Or how about this one from a song lyric? He's got a mind like a sewer and a heart like a fridge. Or this one. This one belongs in the simile hall of fame. The Countess had a smile like the first scratch on a new car. It was imminently regrettable. I could go on with favorite similes all day, endlessly and as tediously as the seconds on a clock, but I'll restrain myself. Personification is when you talk about an inanimate object as if it were a living thing. The old car coughed and wheezed as it struggled up the hill. A car doesn't actually breathe or struggle. It's just a figure of speech. We are comparing it to a feeble old man. We're attributing human qualities to something inanimate. Talking about Mother Nature is personification. Or when journalist Dan Rather, who is from Texas, said of the 2004 presidential election, this race is humming along like Ray Charles. Well, we know perfectly well that an election doesn't hum but we get what he means because we know how personification works. Hyperbole is just a big word that means exaggeration used to make a point or to create a certain effect. If you say that your friend speaks something like a million languages, well, that's hyperbole, but you've made your point. Your friend speaks an impressive number of languages. I am so hungry I could eat two cows, a bale of hay, and still have room for dessert. Hyperbole. Or Mr. Sato is never going to stop talking. Or, it was so quiet you could have heard a pin drop. 
all examples of hyperbole, a form of figurative language. Understatement is the opposite of hyperbole. Lots of teenagers are masters of this one. It's when you say a thing is less than it is, generally to be humorous. If your town closes down Main Street and has a huge and rowdy parade because your town's team has won the championship, you might say, the town had a little party and invited 700,000 of their closest friends. Or if you're talking about the Incredible Hulk ripping open a truck with his bare hands and you say, he's got a bit of a temper. That's understatement. Or, yeah, he's not happy. Idioms are just expressions that make sense if you're familiar with the language. They're metaphors, similes, and other figures of speech that have become common expressions. Like if you were to say he hit it out of the ballpark, someone who is unfamiliar with our language might assume you were talking about baseball when you were actually just using a familiar metaphor to say someone did something really well. Other idioms are, it's raining cats and dogs, and that ship has sailed, and you're pulling my leg. If you're from another country, you'd be like, what? It's raining cats and dogs. What are you talking about? Idioms can also be cliches, overused expressions, which should be avoided, but they can also be a lot of fun if used well. You know, side note, other countries have their own idioms. If you're in Iran and someone says, he put his hat on my head, he or she means he pulled a trick on me or he swindled me. It's a figure of speech. So if a foreigner doesn't understand your idioms, cut him some slack. That'd be you if you jumped on an airplane and learned somebody else's language. An analogy is a simile on steroids. If you said, this family is like a stalled car, that's a simile because you said this thing is like that thing, right? But if you went on to say, a family is like a car, the parent is like the steering wheel because he or she directs the car. But the kids are like the wheels. If the wheels won't move, the steering wheel is powerless and no one is going anywhere. So we need to work together if we want to move forward. When you explain the relationship between the parts of a simile in detail, it becomes an analogy. Teenagers know all about irony. They call it sarcasm most of the time. If a girl said, you know what I love? Changing a flat tire when it's pouring rain. Good times. That's irony. There are at least three kinds of irony, but here we're talking about verbal irony, saying one thing and meaning something very different, usually the opposite. Calling a tall person shorty as a joke, because everyone knows he's tall, is verbal irony. Eating a delicious bowl of chocolate ice cream and saying, it's a dirty job, but someone has to do it, is irony. You're saying one thing and meaning the opposite. But irony can simply mean something different, not necessarily the opposite, like in The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Spoiler alert. The first person narrator is planning to kill someone named Fortunato. Well, there's irony number one. Fortunato isn't fortunate at all. He's about to die. But when Fortunato says, I shall not die of a cough, the killer to be says, true, true. That's irony, because the reader knows that the killer means that's true because he isn't going to die of a cough. The narrator is going to kill him. He says one thing. We know he means something very different. That's a kind of verbal irony, too. And one last note on figurative language. Be original. Fast as a race car is a simile, yes, and it's perfectly acceptable, but it's not a very clever one. Or judging a book by its cover is a metaphor, but it's also a cliche. It's overused, so it isn't very effective. Try to think of fresh, original metaphors that your reader hasn't heard before. Personally, as a teacher, I prefer students to take risks, even if it means they come up with something totally overdone or bizarre, rather than play it safe and be boringly correct. But your teacher might have different preferences. Ask. Okay, so we've talked about these eight kinds of figurative language. Metaphor, simile, personification, hyperbole, understatement, idioms, analogy, and irony. There are more kinds, like synecdoche and apostrophe, but these are the main ones, I think. Here's a time index in case you need to rewatch something. Quiz time. So, what kind of figurative language is being used in these examples? Ten questions. Number one, you are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. Hmm? What kind of figurative language is that? 
Notice, you are the dew on the morning grass. Okay, no more hints. Number two. A hot wind was blowing around my head, the strands of my hair lifting and swirling in it like ink spilled in water. 3. Here's Tupac writing about a person who overcame hard times. Long live the rose that grew from the concrete when no one else even cared. Number 4. The roof might fly off, the walls might buckle from the pressure of his rage. That's a man talking about his drunk, angry father, by the way, not a person with superpowers. Number five, Romeo questions his mortally wounded friend. What, art thou hurt? His friend knows he's going to die from this wound, but he says, Aye, aye, a scratch, a scratch. Six, here the poet is talking about a field of flowers. Ten thousand saw I at a glance tossing their heads in sprightly dance. Number seven. If you want my final opinion on the mystery of life and all that, I can give it to you in a nutshell. The universe is like a safe to which there is a combination, but the combination is locked up in the safe. Number eight. I can resist everything except temptation. Number nine. I heard it through the grapevine. Number 10. Russians are returning to the NHS after souring on the KHL. Figurative language adds subtle shades of meaning to your words and brings out your personality in your writing so you don't sound like a robot from a 1960s B-movie. Figurative language brings your writing to life. Figurative language jumps off the page, grabs your reader by the lapels, and wakes him up. And here are what I think are the correct answers to the quiz. So that's figurative language. Go have some fun with it.